oops, got it. Thanks for that. So supporting complex kids, I'm gonna just go back because you just turned the recording on. So I just wanna get the, the, we're talking about fostering independence in kids, teens and young adults. And we know that supporting these kids, and for us, they're kids, whether they're young or not, as Diane said, they could be at any age, is way, way more complicated than we expected. Um, and, and we often talk these days about raising complex kids in complex times. And that shows up in lots of different ways. It shows up in frustration and anger and avoidance and sometimes in depression or anxiety or um, there's lots of ways that our kids as our kids are, are, are aging into themselves, but not always into their own self-management, there are a lot of ways that that has an impact on family dynamics. And what we know in our work with parents of complex kids and educators who work with complex kids is that the change you want actually starts with you. And the reason we know this is because we work with parents all over the world and because we've lived this. These are our two different families, and Elaine and I come from different um, different backgrounds, but very similar experiences that when we became coaches, we became much more of the kinds of parents that our kids needed us to be in order to become successful and independent. And this is me and my family of young adults, and, and my ex-husband and my partner, and all of, I, I, I am one of those kind of get it done type A moms and was blessed with a bunch of quirky people in my life and found myself being more frustrated than I really wanted to be. I, I was yelling and angry and irritated and all those things. And when I became a coach and started changing the way I was communicating and engaging with my family, our dynamic changed. And I really started helping support my kids in being independent instead of kind of telling them what to do and trying to direct everything myself through the process. Well, well I just so here's what comes up and I'm going to I think we should tweak this in the future the change you want for them yeah starts with you right and so you know I think we spend a lot of time telling our kids how to take care of themselves or what they need to do and we're going to talk about that today and what we really want to invite you to is to shift that dynamic so that you're inviting them and guiding them to to take self-ownership of themselves um and that's a process that's really more about you than it is about them. And that's really kind of hard for us to get our head around. I know some of you who are here, who've been in our programs have, have begin to, are beginning to see the impact of that and how, what a difference that makes when you start changing your approach to them as opposed to only setting expectations for them. And I said this earlier, but helping our kids and young adults begin to take ownership, become more independent, is actually an inter incremental process. It's not just this miracle thing that happens one day and it's like all of a sudden, yay, they're independent. Yeah, although one day you will look back and go, wow, they're independent. Wow, when did that happen? <laughs> when did that happen? But it's really a process that happens gradually. And then, what do we say? Gradually. And gradually then, and then suddenly. And then yeah. suddenly. But it is a process. It's not a moment in time. And that's one of the things we want you to be thinking about is that this isn't an overnight sort of thing where either you're in charge or they're in charge. There's a lot of meat in the in between you being in charge and them being in charge. And that's really where the, the opportunity and the work is. Yeah. So what we know, right, we, we, we know that it's an incremental process and we see them standing in their own way. And that can be so hard to be with. It can be so frustrating. It can be so aggravating. We see them avoiding their responsibilities. We see them taking on really risky behaviors that we know aren't serving them, making choices that aren't healthy for them. There's, there's all kinds of intensities, reactivity, both on their side and our side, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there's a sense of disconnect and mistrust. I, I, I know a lot of times I'm hearing parents lately talk about their kids are just kind of off in their own and, and can barely get them off the couch or off the computer or off you know, whatever it is, I can't get them to engage in what's going on in life right now. And all of this is about, it, oftentimes what's happening that's causing some of the challenges is, is a, a disconnection and a mistrust that's cultivated over time. It doesn't happen suddenly. You know, you look back to the relationship you had when they were two or three or five and, and, and you kind of wonder what happened to that kid. Well, that disconnection what happened to our relationship? That happens over a period of years. It happens over time. And, and we can begin to shift that. 
So we want to challenge you to not just see that they're standing in their own way, but to think about how you might be contributing to the dynamic there. Can, can you see how you might be standing in the way too, right? Because our reactions as adults have, do have a significant impact on our kids' behavior. So whether you're showing up with frustration or resentment or overwhelm or guilt or shame or confusion or any of those things, it can really impact our kids' trust in us, our kids' confidence in themselves and in the situation. It really can add a, a nuance to the dynamic that makes it even more hard to help your kids to become independent. Well, you know, and a couple of things strike me. One is you'll see down here in the corner, this is this is our friend Conscious Connie. We also have a conscious Carl. He's not on the on today's slide. There's a little bit of conscious Connie in all of us, right? We all react in all these different ways. And sometimes we hit it. We do it right. We do it the way we want to. We do it from a conscious place, but not always. And, and none of us believe that you're always going to be able to. But if we can reduce our tendency to react and begin to learn how to respond consciously. When we change our responses, that's gonna actually change behaviors and that's gonna change outcomes. Because in, in coaching, one of the most foundational principles to coaching is that when we change perspective, we change behavior and that changes outcome. This is a key foundational principle to anything in the world of coaching and very much to the work that we do at Impact Parents. If you believe they can or they can't, you're going to be right. And it's going to become, you've heard that notion of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you see it, if you come from a place of fear, that's going to influence what you do. If you come from a place of, of hope or inspiration, that's going to influence how you behave and that will influence behaviors. Well, and the example I like to give here just as an overview is like, if you've got a kid who's having, who's really showing rudeness or lashing out or, uh, you know, just kind of attacking you or, or, or just kind of snarky behavior, any of those sort of unwanted behaviors. And you say, oh my gosh, this kid is rude. This kid is, you know, bad. This kid is, you know, this kid, this is not a okay behavior. This right. is disrespectful, right? If I look at it that way, I'm going to lean towards punishments. I'm going to lean towards defensiveness on my own part. I'm going to lead toward, lean towards taking it personally. I mean, all those sorts of reactions I might have. And if I can shift my perspective and say, wow, this kid is really having a hard time showing respect right now, I'm going to be more likely to lean into maybe helping them or maybe look, looking at what's really going on in this situation that's making them hard to show respect. So the perspective we have on the challenge that our kid is facing is a key part of what helps us to really address and solve the problems. And the other thing that jumps out at me as you say that, Tayyam, is that our kids read us. So if we don't think they can, if we're afraid that they can't, they're going to be afraid that they can't. Yeah. Even, right. if they don't, even if they don't say it out loud, and that's one of the things I want to just say over everything else, our, it, our kids' mm -hmm. verbal communication about what's going on with them is totally inconsistent with what's going on with them really underneath the surface for most kids. Yeah, for sure. Especially teenagers. Yeah especially teenagers. So we really want to invite you to this notion that perspective, your perspective matters, your mindset matters, and it changes outcomes. And we want to start you today with this perspective that we think is really important in particular when you're parenting teens and, and young adults, or when you're supporting them in any environment. And we call it the up until now perspective. Up until now, there's absolutely nothing you can do to change anything that's happened up until now. You did the best you could with what you had, with what information you had, with what you knew, with where things were, and here's where you are. And there is nothing you can do to go back and change anything up until now. But from here forward, you can learn better, know better, and do better. And so we really wanna invite you to give yourself permission today and maybe moving forward, to let go of, of any things you may learn today where you kind of go, oh, why, why did I do that? Or I shouldn't have done that. And just forgive, forgive, forgive whatever's up until now so that you can use this material you're gonna learn today as a way to begin to change things moving forward. And we're gonna give you a framework for, for the, the stages of, of supporting kids. And we're gonna give you some communication tools 
And I know some of you on the, on the call now have had this experience by, by stepping into this up until now, where you've really seen the change in your relationship with your kids or grandkids, because you stopped doing it the other way and started doing it differently and, and maybe try to show yourself some grace in the process. So, uh, you know, we kind of inferred this before, but as we think about their challenges and the things that are going on, really, there are a few things that are underneath it. So maybe you've got a kid who's having a hard time, you know, figuring out what, what they want to do. They're failing out of school or they're having a hard time keeping up with school or they're disengaging from life or they're having a hard time with their homework, those sorts of things. What's often going on underneath these challenges are a few core things. One is that is challenges with communication and trust. There's a lot of breakdowns in communication that happen in the family child dynamic. There's this fundamental power conflict that often happens where our kids want to be able to have more agency in their life. And we see that as a threat or we see that as a, a, a difficulty. And, and this third thing, which is that the desire that they have to be independent often doesn't match their ability to handle things independently. These are kids, complex kids typically have executive function challenges and executive function delays, which means that they're often three to five years behind their peers in terms of their ability to organize or plan or follow through or get started. I mean, all those things that require executive function. And so they wanna be able to be more independent, but they're not actually able to be that way. And we don't know how to do that, be with that other than maybe take over, which is part of what we're gonna talk about today. So, so there are these trust issues, these power conflict and this, this disconnect in their capacity between where they are and where they want to be that underlies their challenges. And so the concept we want to introduce first is what we call the four phases of empowerment. We, also, all, we, we call this a lot of things, four phases of parenting, four phases of the adult, four phases to independence. But ultimately, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. We want to remind you that the change starts with you. And so what we want you to look at as you look at these four phases is your role in relation to this kid. Not where are they and what are they doing, but where are you and how are you interacting with them and communicating with them and in, with an eye towards becoming, helping them become more and more independent. Well, and what we're gonna teach is that there are four of these, direct, collaborate, support, and champion. And most of us know how to direct. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. That's you being in charge and being in the lead. And we dream of the day when our kid is completely independent and doesn't need our help much and we can be in that place of champion. But what we don't know is how to get them from me being in charge to them being in charge. Because often what will happen is the kids will say, mom, dad, stay out of my stuff. And we'll say, fine, good luck. And they're not able to pick up the reins all at once like that. That's kind of overwhelming and not realistic. And so the, the you know, we want either be in direct or champion and 90% of the work is in collaborate and support, which really requires us learning some new skills as collaborators and, and leaders and supporters and in inviting our kids and helping our kids to get to the point where they're ready and available for support. Well, the, the other thing I would say, here is that we have this tendency, particularly when our kids get older, right? With teens and young adults, we direct, we direct, direct. They push us back. We finally say, fine, you do it. And then they falter because they're not actually ready to do it completely independently. They need the support. And then we take that as an opportunity to say, see, I told you so. And then we go back to director mode. And so what Diane is saying, we want to spend 90% of your time here in collaboration support, collaboration support. Once, if you've got a kid over the age of 14, 90% of your time needs to be in these two areas as you're helping them move towards your, your being able to be in phase four. And, and it's a dance, you're, it's not linear. You're not moving, you're not in phase one until they're a certain age and then phase two until another. You might be in, in phase two with them in some areas where there's planning or problem solving to be done in phase three when they're already feeling more independent. So. It's, it's really a constant dance. So let's go into them. Go for it. So start. Directing, again, I think we all know how to do this, right? This is sort of, we're, we're very leading, good at this. We're setting the pace. We're directing what's going on. We're motivating the engagement. Hey, you've got homework to do. Let's have a snack. 
and do your homework before dinner and then we can play a game later, right? It's just sort of, we're taking the lead, we're setting the pace, we're letting them know what needs to be done. It's our agenda by and large. It, they may be interested and in have it be their, agen their agenda as well, but by and large, it's their agenda because they want it do what mom or makes dad us or happy. Whatever, it makes that makes us happy. They're doing it for us. So if you hear yourself saying this kind of stuff and like, well, you need to get your college applications done and you need to call your college counselor and where you need to, you need to, you need to, you need and you're, to, yeah. and they're older, that's a sign that you're in direct mode and it may be time to move into collaboration mode. So collaboration mode is when we begin to share an agenda. You're beginning to motivate their sense of ownership around something. You're modeling organization or working with them to plan and create an organization or a process, but it's not you owning it anymore. It's shared. So in terms of homework, it might be here are the times you have. Um, do you know that we have dinner going out? So you might want to plan for that. You clear what needs to be done. Would it help to go over it? Um, you know, really giving them a sense of agency. When do you want to do it? Where do you want to do it? My kids used to do the homework in the trees a lot. No joke. Um, or I had one who liked to do it on the dining room table so she could bounce her foot off the edge. So here we're beginning to introduce the notion of, of offering help. Can I help you with anything? We want to set rewards and motivation in place. How are you going to celebrate or reward yourself when you're done? But we're sharing an agenda and we're beginning to, it's no longer we have to do homework, but it's your homework, how can I help you? Or it's your application, or it's your, you said you wanted a job. What does it look like? Would you like some help to figure out how to go out and look for a job for the summer? So that there's a collaborative conversation that's happening. And often in collaboration, we're asking questions and we're trying to kind of walk them through the process of problem solving so that they can begin to see how to do it on their own. Well, and so right some of you may be easily collaborating with your kids. I mean, you may, particularly if you've got younger kids, you may be doing this frequently. Um, and what often happens, we are talking about the flip-flopping between director and um, champion, champion, right? And and what often happens with older kids is that they they lose their interest and their desire and, and their trust. And so that makes collaboration difficult. Collaboration, particularly on things that are of challenge to them, like, schoolwork or college applications or all these things we've been talking about, sometimes it requires us to begin to even learn how to collaborate with our kids at the very basic. I love this picture of this family working on dinner together. Collaborating on anything, whether it's a family vacation or cooking dinner or something that they love, that they're inspired by, that you want to kind of work with them, teach me how to play that game you love, right? It's a sort of that sort of collaboration can build that muscle so that you can begin to collaborate on the things that are more difficult. I was just thinking about an example when my kids were younger, not little necessarily, but younger, when we would go on trips, I was, I'm not one of those people that plans out a trip, but when we would go someplace, we would get there and I would sit everybody, sit down with everybody and say, okay, what do you want? To, here's, here's the Google or here's the map or whatever. What do y'all want to do while you're here? And we would all be part of planning what we would do, or we would be part of planning the meals, or sometimes we would divvy up and it's like two different people get a meal for each night. Or, and it would become a process where we're all part of creating it instead of me telling everybody what we're going to do. And by doing that, we're not only bringing them into a sense of agency, but we're teaching them to process and problem solve for themselves, which is one of the most essential skills for our kids to learn. Well, and asking questions at these stages of phase two or phase three, well, what do you think? What are your ideas? What do you want to accomplish? We'll bring them into the agenda, which is really ultimately part of what we're doing is we're building buy-in, we're building motivation, and we're building their ownership, which is really what phase three is all about, which is supporting and, and really supporting their ownership and, in, and encouraging them to ask for help. You know, it, it, the language here is, seems like you're on top of things. Can we talk about it? What's your plan? What help do you think you might need? Who could help you? Is there anything? Sometimes it's not us. <laughs> sometimes it's not us, right? It's just sort of, is there anything I can do to support you? And if you're feeling pushback there, that might be a good indication that maybe that you have to go back to building trust and building collaboration or shifting your focus from getting stuff done to how do I begin to create a space that makes it easier for my child to accept help from anywhere or from me? 
Yeah, and modeling asking for help is a really powerful tool. The other thing that strikes me is that oftentimes we, we begin to see our kids move into this realm when they get a license. If they haven't already, this is, this is a great time because they begin to feel the, the gravity of what it means to drive a car and the responsibility of it. And, and so there, there's a lot of great conversations that can be had with those kind of mid, middle teenage years as they begin to see what it feels like to be responsible to then invite them to take it on in other areas. So champion is that place we all dream of. You know, we want to be here to celebrate, to troubleshoot. Our kids call us and tell us that they had a win and we say, great job. Um, and, and this is the dream and this is the direction and we still have a role when they're there. Um, and, and this is, I, I guess I'm going to tell a story on my oldest today called me, he was just meeting me because he wanted me to look at his business cards and it, and we actually met in person and the conversation ended up being, he's trying to figure out what he wants to do next in his career. And he didn't, he needed, I thought he needed a champion, but he really needed some support. And so we took a step backwards and I said, you know, started asking him a lot of questions and figuring out, did you need, does he need accountability? Does he need help to really create a plan, you know, and really stepped out of, you know, so it's that dance between championing and then knowing, you know, my kid needs a little bit more help on this. How do I get them to invite me in to help them or find help for themselves because they, that they're struggling even, even at, you know, 30, 40 years old or 30, 30, 20, 30 years old. Well, and I was just thinking about how, how lucky I am to still have my parents with me as, as old as they are, that my mom is still my biggest champion, right? And I may not go to her for troubleshooting very often anymore, although sometimes I, I still do, but she is still the person in my life whom I know is always going to be there rooting me on. And when I need the support, she's going to step back into phase three, as you say, Diane, and offer it to me. So we're, you know, those of us who are parents, we're parents, this, we're in it for the long haul, right? So these are the, this is what we're talking about in terms of the adult's role in terms of empowering or independence or, or again, a lot of ways we call it, but, but the four phases of the adult directing, collaborating, supporting, and championing, and knowing that we're constantly dancing between them, particularly in, once we move out of director mode um, into, into these other areas, collaboration, support. And even as Diane said, sometimes we step out of champion and into support and then back in. So really knowing that this is a fluid action, our, our relationship in terms of our kids. Should we move on? Yep. So just as, as a way to kind of close off this conversation, take a minute for yourself and think about one current power struggle or one current challenge you have with your kid or your young adult and ask yourself, what phase are you in? What phase does your kid really want you to be in? And what, kid is your, what phase is your kid ready for you to be in? And those are three different pieces that are all part of this discussion. It's this sort of, because if your kid wants you to be in champion, but you think that he needs you to be in collaboration, you're going to approach this situation very differently than if they want you to be in support and you want to be in support. And so that there's a, a, a matching there. So we would encourage you to catch in the chat. Hey. What, what phase Sorry, are you in? Oh, what phase does your kid want you to be in? And is that different from the phase they need you to be in? Really pay attention to that distinction. Capture it for yourself. We often say, we know people tend to skip over the exercises, but part of the, the beauty of coaching is to not only take information, but to learn how to use that information and apply it. So when you take the time to say, okay, what am I getting from this? How is it speaking to me personally? This is how you personalize any kind of a group coaching or training or whatever, how you personalize it to your experience. What phase are you in? What phase does your kid want you to be at? And what phase are they ready for you to be at? And I'm curious how many directors there are in the, in the room who are beginning to see maybe it's time to move into collaboration. So Diane, I wanna design with you for a moment around time because we've got about half an hour left and I wanna make sure we have time for Q and A. Yeah, so you wanna keep going? Yeah, but, but again, I really wanna encourage y'all to do this to capture to the chat. What phase does your kid want you to be in and what are they ready for you to be in? 
So we're going to take you through a series of competencies around communication, because really at the core of this are some things that you can do differently in terms of how you're engaging, communicating with your kiddos that can really help you along that journey from director to collaborator to supporter to champion. So there's eight of them here, and we're just going to go through each one of them. And as we do, that, this is a classic coaching wheel. It's just a tool for you to use to really look at how am I doing? How do I feel about how I'm doing on each one of these? So take a minute as you're listening to us and reflect on your own satisfaction with how you're handling things. Well, and two things I want to add. One is that this is not an invitation to beat yourself up for what you're not doing. Right. This is just a slice of, of life, a moment of time. How am I feeling about how I'm being in terms of being calm or failing forward? We'll, we'll get to these. So that this is not to beat yourself up, but to just, just check in with yourself, to assess, not to grade yourself, but just, just to assess how am I doing. And then the other thing I want to say is almost every concept we're going to cover in the next 15, 20 minutes, we could spend an hour or more talking about. So know that we're just giving you a cursory overview with some cool key competencies. And there's a lot more, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot more we can do with each of these and a lot more places for you to learn how to apply them. So bear with us. We wanna give you something concrete to leave with today. And it's not what we would call a deep dive. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is stay calm. And, and focus on calm and only calm, right? It's this sort of paying attention to your emotional level, your kid's emotional level, your co-parent's emotional level, you know, and, and having fierce commitment to the fact that if you're not calm, your ability to problem solve is completely different. I mean, we're talking about perspective shifts. One of the most valuable perspective shifts is the understanding that if anybody's triggered, anybody's overwhelmed, anybody's upset, they're not available to problem solve. You really want to have these collaborative and supportive conversations and engagements at a time when everybody's calm. And so that's that includes why, them. That includes them. And you may not know when they're calm. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, some of us don't even know when we're, when we're calm, but some of those avoidance behaviors and stay out of it mom behaviors and all of those things that those unwanted behaviors, a lot of those are indicators that our kids are overwhelmed and stressed out and triggered, and that it might not be a good time to problem solve. And so we've got to shift our focus to helping our kids to calm down and have more moments of calm in their life so that we can have more moments of collaboration. Elaine, what, you, anything you want to add? Well, just one of the things we talk about a lot in, in, in our groups and in our coaching is this notion of breadcrumbs, that sometimes a single conversation can take a week or more to happen. And, and part of being calm and committing to calm is recognizing that when someone gets triggered and the calm is not there anymore, we need to stop and come back to it later. That we don't have to push through a conversation. In fact, we shouldn't push through a conversation if people are feeling triggered because you're not gonna get an effective problem solving. You're gonna get a triggered response. Well, and part of the challenge there is that a lot of us, when we get triggered, our brain says, we've got to fix this right now. now? Yeah. And so we like where our tendency when we're triggered is to push through. And that's so we're countering that natural tendency. The second tool we want to talk about is being, it's actually a combination of tools, but it's about being open and transparent and curious. And it's really about that balance between, you know, focusing on what's going on with us and focusing on what's really going on with them. And so sharing with our kids, wow, I'm really struggling with this, or getting curious about what's really going on with our kids is, an op is a more opening way to really connect with our kids so that we can work together and begin to collaborate or support in a different way. What would you add? Well, two things. One, I was just thinking, like, curiosity is our topic for the week in our group coaching program this week. And, and there's, we were, as coaches, talking about, well, how do we want to talk about it? And by the time we all shared something, it was like this, this long, like how many, all the different reasons curiosity can be helpful and all the different ways it can be useful and places to use it. But at the end of the day, it's a powerful tool to change perspective. And so really using curiosity as a way to see things from a different lens can be very powerful. Um, and in terms of transparency, openness and transparency, if we can step out of the need to look a certain way, to appear as if we know what we're doing and allow our kids to see that we're human and we're figuring it out and sometimes we don't know and sometimes it's hard to, for us, 
that humanizes us in their eyes. And they really want us to be human and not to feel like, like they're supposed to know how it is because as they become adults, and I've got three young adults, helping them understand that adulting is hard and that it doesn't, it's not necessarily intuitive can be really powerful to give them permission to wrestle with it instead of feeling like they're just supposed to have it. So transparency is also about being straightforward. We're gonna talk about this again in a minute in terms of failing forward. So again, go back to that wheel, scale of one to 10. How do you feel like you're, how do you assess how your, your satisfaction with how you are in terms of being open, transparent, and curious? The next one is failing forward. And failing forward is about our relationship with mistakes. And, you know, you know, some of us have a lot of baggage around making mistakes. And so create an environment where we're not saying, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I can't believe this happened either in our own life or watching how our kids' relationship with failure is playing out, but really saying, okay, so that didn't work the way I wanted it to. What do I want to try next? Instead of like, what happens a lot of times with our kids is they'll, something won't go the way that they wanted it to. And they just shut down. Parents say this all the time. Oh, I tried that. Right. And I tried that. It didn't work. Right. And yeah. we know by definition, if you've got a complex kid, sometimes stuff works and sometimes it doesn't work. And so you've got to be willing to say, okay, wait, that totally didn't work. What do I want to try next? Or how do I learn from what didn't work? You know, we, we, we teach magic three questions. What worked? What didn't? What do you want to try next? Um, well, and the, the other thing I would say in terms of fail, failing forward is a lot of us see our kids not doing what they're expected to do. And we feel like they don't care. They're not trying. Oftentimes, what's underneath that is actually their own perfectionism and their own fear of failure. And maybe we've created an environment that made it not okay to fail. I think I did that a lot when my kids were little unintentionally. Um, I have one of my kids is a serious perfectionist and, and they said to me, don't you see mom, if I haven't done it, I haven't done it wrong. So here I am like, how can you not do your homework? And they're so busy writing a sentence and tearing it up and writing a sentence and throwing it away that they can't get the, the work done because they're so afraid to get it wrong. So failing forward comes in a lot of realms. The next one is about designing expectations together. And this is really about agreements and conversations and really making it, particularly as your kids get older, conscious conversations about how do we want to work this? So there's two components to the design. And again, the design is one of those two tools we teach in communication classes and parenting young adult groups. And um, it's complicated, but it's really simple. So the simple piece of it is that before we ask for something, we offer something first. Offer, maybe it's an acknowledgement, maybe it's a recognition, maybe it's an apology, maybe it's, it's, it's an offer to do something. You know, I used to say to my son, you can count on me to let you, to, to let you know when it's Monday night and time to take the trash out. And I want to ask you when I do, if you would stop what you're doing and go, get the, to, go take the trash out. Fine, fair. And, and it was a good arrangement because I wasn't nagging and asking three times and, and we had an agreement. So the designing expectations is, is about having conversations about how we're gonna navigate things. One of my favorite design tools is to say to a kid, if you've got an agreement, this happens a lot with, with older teens and kids who are living at home but working, um, you know, and they're like, leave me alone, I got it. Okay, great, how do you want me to handle it if I know your alarm's going off and you're not up and you need to get to work? What do you want me to do? So instead of coming in and saying, I need to get you up, you ask them to tell you how they want you to be with it. You're designing how we're gonna be in relationship with each other. And it's an ongoing process. You wanna add anything? Nope, I think that's great. The next tool, the, uh, the next piece of this is, is something we teach that's called ACE. Acknowledge, show compassion, and wait, which is the dot, 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 or the dash and then explore options. And this is an amazing tool to use, particularly when someone's uh, in, in conflict or escalated. You really wanna take a minute and see their side of things, acknowledge their perspective of what's going on, have compassion for what's going on for them. I can tell you're really upset about what happened between your, you and your brother. And it makes perfect sense that you would be frustrated because he keeps bugging you when you're trying to do your homework. And then you wait, 
and you wait for the de-escalation or you wait for them to vent about it or you wait for a, a time, again, we talked about calm earlier, a time when they're a little bit more calm. And then rather than just telling them what to do, which is what we tend to do, we tend to explain, we tend to go to, well, I know you ha you're having a hard time doing your homework, but you got to get it done. But if you would just, right. Yeah, exactly. We want to explore. So you can tell you're really upset. Is there something you need right now to kind of shift that so you're less upset? Or when do you think you'll be ready to get going again? Or is there something I can do to help you? So, so the other thing I want to say is when, when I, where this came from, and this is probably like, if we went to our audience and said, what's the number one tool you use, not concept, but tool, this would probably be it. ACE is really, really powerful. Um, and acknowledgement and compassion is the core of empathy. And this actually came from a Brene Brown video I was listening to. And I, and I kind of broke it down as she was talking about empathy and realized what it's really about first is about acknowledging someone and being seen, having them be seen or heard or listened to, and then helping them see that it makes sense, that you can relate, that you can feel the feeling. And that is such a powerful thing, particularly for teens and young adults. They just want to be seen and they feel so invisible so much of the time and they feel so controlled so much of the time. So ACE is really about helping them feel a sense of agency again before we get into problem solving. And explore your options is kind of a, a euphemism for problem solving in a lot of different ways. The next one is about asking permission. And, and we refer to this as the, the, the virtual knock on the door. And how many times do we as parents, it's like all day long, we're thinking, oh, I got to ask them about this, or I got to talk to them about that. And we just- well, That's a teaching point. I got to make sure I teach yeah, them that. I got to make sure I teach them that lesson, right? It's just like we barge into a conversation without being invited or without asking if we're interrupting or without kind of even- checking in first. And we want to remind you that these are, you know, sentient beings. These are independent beings that have their own agendas and their own lives and their own everything else. And so if we take a moment to build respect into the communication process and say, hey, I need your attention on this. Can I catch you right now? Are you in the middle of something? Is this a good time? Is this a good time? Or I have an idea. Can I, can I share it with you? I have something I'd like to offer, yeah. right? Not, you need to learn this. I need you to know this, but I have a thought. Would you like to hear it? It reinforces, I don't mean to interrupt you, Diana. No, I'm just go ahead. Kind of riffing with you. Yeah. Um, it, it reinforces their sense of autonomy. I'm an independent being and you respect that I have my own thoughts and feelings. And by the time a kid is a teenager, they are independent beings with their own thoughts and feelings and ideas and agendas. And you may not agree with them, but if, the, if you can respect that they have them separate from what you think they should be doing, that really goes a long way to, to begin to collaborate with them and helping them move forward on their agenda. And oh, by the way, it might be a great model if you're wanting them to do the same thing for you. Yeah. I mean, asking permission, it's a, it's a real game changer, yeah. I would say, in a lot of relationships to build relationship, which is a key foundation, as Diane alluded to earlier key foundation to all of this independence is the ability to, to really pay attention to the relationship. Okay, we have a few more. Let's move quick. Yeah, yeah. Shedding the shoulds. It's really easy to have all kinds of stories in our head about what our kids should be able to do. Well, they're 19. They should be able to do this. Or I should have, I should have done this earlier. I mean, that kind of gets back to the perspective shift of up, to, up until now. And Oftentimes when we have a should in there, it really does create a trigger. It creates judgment. It creates a sense of uh, anxiety that I've got to fix this right away. And so we want to let go of the shoulds, whether they're our own or the external ones to the extent that we can so that we can stay more in problem solving mode. Well, a should is somebody else's expectations and, and somebody else's expectations always feels a little yucky. But if you can begin to set your own expectations and help your kids feel, set theirs, you can shed the shoulds and start operating based on what, what you want, what they want, instead of what somebody else wants for them. So I alluded to this earlier, breadcrumbs. Yeah, breadcrumbs is something we talked about earlier, but this is, it doesn't have to happen all at once. And sometimes our kids are even better if we just go in and like drop a little seed or a little idea and then run back out again. <laughs> Like the sandpiper at the end of the water, right? Run in, drop it, run away. Run in, drop a little something. Sometimes conversations happen over time. I was talking with somebody yesterday, I think it was in a group, about 
um, you know, sometimes you can drop the, an acknowledgement. You know, we talked about ACE. You can do the acknowledgement and the compassion and then leave it and don't even go to problem solving yet, right? So, I, you know, I saw that, that that was really frustrating and I just want to say that I can, I can imagine that that must have been hard for you and I'm really impressed with how you handled it and leave. Like you don't need to belabor the issue. Sometimes we just need to drop it and move on. So take a minute and reflect on all of these tools we've talked about. And as Elaine said, we, we teach, you know, hour long workshops on each one of these in some way or shape or form. And, and everything is in all of our programs, but just kind of look at, at, this is an opportunity to kind of look at one or two of these that you might be, wow, I'm doing this really well, or wow, I really um, need to do better at this. Those of you who are already in our programs and, and are, are here listening to us, you know, a good opportunity to kind of say, Oh yeah, I've been working on that for the last six months and I feel like I'm doing a little, a little better than I want than I was six months ago. But take a minute and just look at these and, and see what jumps out as something potentially to work on as you leave our conversation today. So I'm going to actually offer two steps. First step is scale of one to 10. Give yourself an evaluation or an assessment. How am I doing? How do I feel? How satisfied am I in this arena? And then, as Diane says, choose one or two that you might want to work on moving forward. And it doesn't have to be the worst one. It might be the best one. Yeah, I want to. You want to play to the strength. Really well, I want to do it even better, right? Right. So try to identify what you want to focus on moving forward. And I really would encourage you to capture this in the chat. What are you noticing about these communication competencies? Some of you, as as Diane says, are in our community, so. What have you noticed about how you've been using them? I know Mike and Peggy, y'all are here and I know you've used a lot of these tools and found great success this year. What are you aware of? And we're gonna start coming to a close so that we can answer some questions. I wanna, as a disclosure, I wanna share that all of the material we've shared with you is, as I say, the tip of the iceberg. It's all in our behavior training program for parents called Sanity School. And it's all in the companion guide, the essential guide to raising complex kids with ADHD, anxiety, and more. And we teach all of these coaching skills and a whole lot more and a lot of concepts in these programs as a way to help parents begin to learn to shift uh, how you're working with your kids and communicating with your kids in particular moving forward. And we have a, a free gift for you, impactparents.com slash signet. Diane, what is the, the download? It's, the, it's a tip sheet on um, in, in independence. And so it's, it's got some great additional tips for you in terms of su supporting your kids to become more independent. And so there are 12 tips. A couple of the ones you've seen here are going to be on that worksheet and then a number of new ones and really giving you some tools and strategies. It's a guide really more than a tip sheet some tools and strategies to be able to apply them immediately to your communication patterns to begin to see the kind of change you're looking for. So thanks, yeah, Diane, it's impactparents.com slash signet. And I, you know how to spell We'll be it. sending that, um, <laughs> we'll be sending that link out um, with our follow-up to the webinar, along with the recording uh, of this webinar as well. So if you wanna share it with other people, or if you wanna go back to review something, um, you'll have that within the next day or so. Right, and I've just, I, and I do encourage you to capture in the chat, and I really appreciate Jay sharing that, um, the items to work on are, are staying calm. I get caught in the cycle of reacting and breadcrumbs is just such a beautiful way to think about not pushing an agenda, but inviting a conversation and being strategic about connecting. So thank you for that observation. And Leslie's focused on calm first. I've been saying it lately in terms of commit to calm. If you can commit to calm, everything from there unfolds. Yeah, well, it's that fierce commitment that we're going to solve this problem better if we're not triggered. Right. Thank you both. This is really, really great. We had a couple of questions come in while you were presenting. Um, do take down the, Elaine, do you want to take down the slides? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, sorry, Sheila, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So earlier, um, uh, Hee-Jung was... was uh, Oh, sorry, actually, Brigitte was asking, is it ever okay to be a director or in phase one with a preteen? I wonder what your reaction to that question is. You want to start? Yeah, no, I think that, that I have two ways of looking at this because, you know, if director is really ultimately, 
you know, your agenda, you're setting the boundary. And, and I, there's part of me that wants to say, you know, if, if there's danger involved and your kid is, you know, in a difficult situation, that might be a time to put a boundary up. And, and, and I want to say to all of you, whenever you need to do that, you also want to invite them in, right? It's a sort of, I want to put a boundary up and give you a choice, right? This is, this is critical. This needs to happen. And I want to do it in a way that feels okay for you, right? So you, it's a yes and, um, and Elaine, I'm kind of curious how you would. So the short that. answer I would say is yes. Yeah. There are times where it's appropriate to be in phase one with a teen. You just don't want to stay there. Yeah. Right. You want to, you want to hit whatever you need to hit. Cause they're only, you know, 12 or 13 or whatever. And then you want to start collaborating again. You want to invite them to ownership and agency, but absolutely. I mean, there are times where I'm in a director mode with my 25 year old, but only when we're in a, working through something in a collaboration and I may ask permission and say, do you need me to just tell you da, 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 do. Yeah. right? Like it may be like when she was really independent in college and mostly in, mostly in phase, you know, mostly four. And then there were times where we, I needed to move into phase three. And then a couple of times, you know, during exams or stuff where I needed to move into two and help her figure out what her supports were. And occasionally, cause she struggles with anxiety you know, I'll say, do you need me to right now? And, and so, yeah, even then sometimes moving to phase one. So there's no hard, fast rule about age. It's about where is your kid and what do they need from you as you're knowing you're using it as, as a way of moving them towards independence. Great. Now, he Jung asked, um, uh, sometimes it takes uh, several times for her to ask her son to do something. Uh, it takes a long time. He eventually does it, but um, what else can she do in those situations? Well, I want to go back to that tool of curiosity and really kind of say, what's going on in this situation? Is it that you don't quite have his attention? Is it that he's getting distracted in the middle of it? Is it about, um, you know, him needing reminders and follow-ups and things like that. I mean, these are kids with delays in executive function. He may need some kind of structure to help him support his working memory. So really starting with what's going on here um, can, can be a, a place to really figure out what's going on underneath the problem. Elaine, what would you add? Well, I would say, and I don't know how old your son is, but look at the word in your, in your question, to direct my son to do something. Yeah. You're in director mode. So when you think about, okay, how do I shift into collaboration mode and what would that look like? And how do I begin to help him take responsibility for what he needs to do and eventually move to a point where he's putting structures in place, that's moving through the, the phases. But if you're trying to direct him to do something, part of the problem is you're in director mode. Now, if he's five, it's a different story, but most of you are not here with five-year-olds. So part of it is if you're directing, you're holding the agenda. So what can begin to shift to help him begin to own the agenda so that he sees it as his responsibility to remember to do it instead of waiting for you to do it? Because if you're going to remind him, why should he bother? Kind of like if you're going to be the one on him on homework every night, why should they even bother figuring it out? They know you're going to come in and do it. So if you're holding the agenda, the, the analogy we often use is if riding a horse, if you're holding the reins so tight here, you got to loosen the reins enough to hand them to them for them to be able to take the reins for themselves. But if you're holding them, why should they bother? They're not going to get to ride it anyway. Right. Great. Very helpful. Um, other questions, feel free to um, either come off mute and ask. I want to, or... I want to comment about oh, something because Bryce oh, is saying, um, I've been hard on myself recently with a few decisions I've made with my daughter that I wish I had been done differently. And I need to work on fail forward. And I want to remind you to go back to that notion of up until now, right? We often talk to, about parenting from inspiration instead of desperation. And when you're feeling like, oh, I didn't do that and I shouldn't have handled it that way, whatever, the, the there are a couple of other tools we've given you today. Up until now is a framework. And transparency is a great tool to be able to go back and say, you know, I really don't like the way I handled that or the way that unfolded or whatever. And I'm, and I'm sorry, or I'd like to do it differently. Or can we have a do over? You will earn so much respect from your kid. If you acknowledge your role in it, instead of just trying to kind of pretend like it didn't happen, but up until now is about you forgiving yourself mm -hmm. so that you can allow yourself to do it differently moving forward. That's so great. 
What else? What other questions we got? Probably time for another good question. How can we how can we help you manage on a day to day basis a little bit better? Thank you, Victoria. Up until now is important because we will only. Oop! I just lost it. Parent from what we knew before. This may include how our parents parented us. Absolutely. We've got all kinds of patterns that came in. I was just talking to a client and it's a lot of cultural things. There's a lot of, you know, intergenerational things. So that that's all of, all a part of this, all a part of your background and, and baggage. If I can use it, that sometimes it becomes baggage, but paying attention to this and understanding that that plays in is an important piece of this. Well, so I, I, I want to say one more thing while we got a moment before we close, because I know that this audience, some of you are from our community, some of you are from Signet. And, you know, we're, we, we're all focusing on these kids and trying to help them reach their potential and be successful and accomplish what they need to accomplish. And the kind of the macro message that I think we're trying to get you to understand here is that, yes, that change starts with you. And it, it cha the change is in about getting the support that you need as a parent to learn the tools that you need to be able to shift the dynamic, to, to communicate differently, to empower them differently, to enroll them in. It's not just about getting them to achieve, to kick and scream to their own success, as I used to do with my kid um, before I started this realm, but to invite them to begin to feel empowered. And that change starts with you. And that's not something that you've probably learned. So give yourself permission to get the help that you need, because that's part of support and treatment for your kids is for you to learn how to, how to set a different realm in terms of expectations and accountabilities. Well, and, and it's funny, I'm, I'm reflecting, Elaine, you know, we talk about this all the time. And so I, I feel like sometimes we make this sound simple and it really, it really isn't that simple. And we started with the fact that parenting complex kids is really hard and hard. It's completely different than what we expected. And you've got kids with ADHD, you've got kids with executive function challenges. Some of you have kids with depression and anxiety. And so, you know, that sort of or autism or whatever, or whatever, right? autism or whatever it is, it's like sort of, oh my gosh, I'm afraid to push my kid because I don't want to push them over the deep end. And I guess what I want to invite you to is, is if you're feeling like you're struggling as a parent, get some help for yourself, right? That's, that's why we do what we do. We do parent training, we do parent coaching. And most of what I want <laughs> to feel is that they're not alone and that there is something that they can do to make it easier for themselves and ultimately better for their kids. And so I want to encourage you to, to reach out, to connect with us, um, to become part of our community. If it feels like what our message that we sent today really resonates with you. Elaine, you were going to jump in. Well, yeah, well, if you can type in the chat, the, the link that they're going to, and I know that, that Sheila, you're going to send it, but Polly is saying, how do you help a kid come up with their own solutions when they get stuck? And I love the awareness that your solutions are yours and not theirs. So it's hard for them to get on board. That's part of the dance that we're talking about. That's where the collaboration comes in. You know, when a kid says, I don't know, that's usually because they don't know. And so that's where asking permission can be really powerful. Like maybe you say, I have an idea. Would you like to hear it? Instead of, well, why don't you try this? Because when you say, would you like to hear it? And they say, yes, they're actually going to receive that information differently than if you just tell them. Because if, if you tell them it's external information, if they say yes, they've invited it in and they will experience it differently. Their brain will so, actually hear it differently. Exactly. And they'll process it and, and be able to use it differently. Um, uh, thank you. Someone is saying, I'm really enjoying taking Sanity School and it's a great program. Thank you. Um, it's, it's all about, it's about the process, Polly. It's about learning how to get into those nuances and to have those conversations constructively without putting them on the defensive and without turning them off. And that's, that's your job. That, that change starts with you, not with them. Which I get, I get that you get. <laughs> Can I jump in for a quick verbal question here? I'm going to try yeah. to type in. And then, so this, I'm Jay, um, one of the co-owners of Signet with Sheila. Um, so you just you just mentioned the process, and can you tell us a little bit about? I mean, we're we're talking about changing a lifetime of programming in terms of dealing with our kids, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Can you just 
talk about like what does that process of change look like is it something that you just start a little bit and it takes hold is it a constant discipline is it like is this a thing you got to really commit to for like a year before you see results like how does that change actually look because that's this is a this is quite big if if, if that makes sense yeah it is thanks for that question so a couple things come to mind first is the incremental change a transformational change happens in tiny little increments right? If you look at what's happening with Noom in the world and people learning to lose weight by little tiny habits, tiny changes. So the transformation that you want is going to happen in these tiny little steps. And, and it is, I mean, I appreciate that question, Jay, because it, it does take time. And, you know, parents are often, we've done our own research, parents want a magic bullet. And, and that's not what's going to get you the lasting change. What's going to get you the lasting change is beginning to change how you're having conversations and how you're approaching problem solving. And it takes some time to learn it. And then, so there's information and then to begin to practice it and apply it. So, you know, in our, we have a group coaching program. So often parents will do sanity school and then group coaching. And, um, and we invite parents, we ask parents to commit to a year for group coaching. We know they're not going to go every single time, you know, in the whole year. We know part of that is about life interferes, but we know that change takes time. And so while we do offer shorter installments and people can do it in, in less time, oftentimes people will come in for a year and then stay for a couple of years because it's a great support structure to begin to think about how do I want to be a conscious parent to this really amazing kid? And that does take time. Well, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, our kids change over time. I mean, it's not the challenge. I had a mom the other day and her challenge was a nine-year-old with, you know, really intense meltdowns. And, you know, I, the conversation we had was, well, okay, so once you have worked for a bit on the meltdowns and things have calmed down, the likelihood is that this kid with executive function challenges is going to encounter something else. You know, something else yeah. is going to come up in fifth grade. Something else is going to come up in junior high or in high school. And, you know, what I love about what we do is that we're teaching parents an approach to handle whatever the challenge happens to be, right? Yeah. If you've got, I've got another mom with two different kids and their kids are, her kids are so very different. And she was really, really sure. And I agreed with her hundred percent that the solution for one kid was going to be completely different than the solution for the other kid. And so you're not looking for, again, the magic bullet or the the roadmap the of quick this fix. happens yeah. in this, right? It's it's really about how do I approach this challenge? How do I collaborate with my kid? How do I partner with my kid to develop those sustainable skills and ultimately launch them successfully, whether it's two years from now or 10 years from now? Okay. What we're trying to do here is to, to raise healthy, independent adults. adults and adults. Well, I like to call it a bring it on attitude. Like what I want for, for everybody I work with and for everyone in our community is to have a kind of like, bring it on. I got this. Whatever's coming at me, I can handle it. I know how to navigate it. I know how to communicate around it. I, I, I don't feel beaten down by it or scared by it. Um, you know, somebody in the, ch in the chat is talking about, you know, we can do this in our best days, but then the pressures and activities and demands come in. It's like, I want you to be able to do it even when you're where, when the de demands are coming in. And when you really get in here and you start to practice it, you can, you can continuously con collaborate and support in a constructive and healthy way. And we've got our work to do as parents to be able to do that. We have, it, this is our work, right? Yeah. They call it parenting for a reason. Well, and I don't want anybody to hear pressure from that. You know, it's, no. it's we're all gonna have bad days and we're gonna all have days that we're not great parents. And what I want you to do is to recover well and apply that up until now thing again and give yourself some grace and ask for forgiveness if you need to and, and keep moving forward. Um, Somebody we else. are going to have to wrap it up. Close it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we did get a great question at the end here. Um, do you also coach complex kids? And I know you guys do some, right? And that's something that Signet also specializes in where this sort of relationship has come from. So um, JH, maybe this is something we, a uh, conversation we take offline. Um, well, here's what I want to say is um, oftentimes when parents come and they say, my kid needs coaching, our answer is, is your kid asking for help? 
So that's one of the ways that we gauge it. Um, we believe that parent support alongside student support is the most effective. Um, and, and if you're here with Signet, you're, you're in the right place to get the support you need for your kids. And we would love to be able to help you with, with your role in that equation. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and staying on a few extra minutes. Elaine and Diane, always such a pleasure. I learn so much every time I hear you guys speak uh, and I look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you. Truly a pleasure. Thanks for coming, everybody. Take care, everyone.